Devin here. I hope you had a great Christmas break now that we're back together, back at youth. Yes, we're still online, and I know that's not what we were hoping for, but unfortunately with the restrictions and all that stuff being extended, it just it makes the most sense for all of our safety for us just to continue online in our small groups. So I hope that you enjoy your time digging in. Um, we're going to be continuing in our series that we were working on just before Christmas called Live Like Jesus. Now, I know for a lot of you, Christmas breaks happened, you've had downtime, you've done schoolwork, time has passed, and it's very easy for you to have forgotten what we were talking about. So I want to share a little bit with that about the point of this series with you tonight before we dig into the topic and the scripture that we're going to be looking at. But um, the series is just called Live Like Jesus or living like Jesus, or however you want to word it together. But basically, the whole point of this series is that we're going to be learning from Jesus' teachings, the times where he said, hey, listen up, learn from this, 
here's something I have to say that's going to teach and change and impact your life. So we're studying from his life, specifically from the book of Matthew, as all these teaching points are from, but you can find simil- similar variations of it in Mark, Luke, and John as well. Some parts aren't in those because of the perspective of the author, not because that's not part of the scripture. But these are also the way that Jesus lived. So we're not just, Jesus didn't just say, okay, do this, behave this way, act this way, and now I'm done with you. And he went off and did his own thing. He's saying, behave this way, do this, act this way, and follow as I lay out the example of what living and giving honor and glory to me truly looks like. So our our topic for tonight is on forgiveness. Now, I feel like I've talked on forgiveness just recently, but this is definitely one of the ones that's like very hard to do, definitely something that's challenging, but it's also one of the most pivotal and crucial parts of being a Jesus follower and, and living life. Forgiveness isn't just for those who believe in Jesus. Yes, it's important, and we'll learn that later on in our scripture, but for all of you in life, forgiveness is very important because it, it helps you become healthy. It helps you live life to the fullest. It helps you not carry weight and burden of previous decisions or previous lives or, or previous people's actions that get in the way. But I'm not just going to sit here and say, hey, forgiveness, it's super simple. You all need to forgive, so why aren't you forgiving? Because it actually is rather challenging. It actually is rather difficult. Sometimes there's people that have, that have wronged you so badly that you're just like, I can't forgive them. I can't let this go. But this section of scripture we're going to actually be looking at is Jesus sharing with his disciples just after he talked about forgiving, telling them to forgive those who had sinned against them. And what that means is it's someone that has actually done something wrong, caused harm, and hurt you. How should you behave? Should you forgive them? Should you not forgive them? Well, he's challenging his disciples saying, you need to forgive them, even if they have done something specifically to you. And then he goes in and he explains the section of scripture that we're going to be looking at. Now, the specific scripture is Matthew 18, verses 21 to 35. And feel free to open up your Bible apps if you want to follow along or open up your physical Bibles if you have one, like I have mine here. And if you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. Uh, if not, you can just listen back and get what's happening in through this. But because this is a large section, like this is 14 verses, I could just read it all at once and expect you to memorize every single little section, but I figured we'd break it up into smaller chunks, read and talk, read and talk, read and talk, and that way we can kind of work through and wrestle through this story to the fullest of its potential. So why don't we dig in to this together, starting in verse 21. We're going to read from section from verses 21 to verses 27 as our first chunk of the story. So it says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? It's a great question. As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. So there's a lot happening even in these six verses here. So we're jumping in directly after what Jesus just taught. And that's how if someone sins against you, someone wrongs you, someone hurts you, then you are to forgive them. And Peter comes in with like this slinger of a question. He's just like, okay, well, how many times should I forgive someone that's wronged me? Is it seven times? And the the choice of the word seven, there's something to do with numbers of seven and them being seen as like perfect and whole and complete. So he's saying that to be like, you know, just doing it like, you know, seven times, that's like the perfect amount of times to forgive someone. So then after the eighth, you know, I, I I can get even or I can seek revenge or I can go after them. And Jesus 
hears this and goes, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. It should be seven times 70, which is like even more, but it wasn't about the math. It wasn't like Jesus said, you know, seven times 70, break this down, it's this number. That's how many times after that start wronging them. What he was saying is it should be even beyond, far beyond what people would see as like the perfect amount of times of forgiving someone. And then he goes into this parable. And I love this parable. And we, we were just starting to scratch the surface of it. There's a lot that actually happens in it. And then the meaning at the end is, is almost terrifying in all honesty. But we're focusing on, on the first chunk. So in this parable, you have a king that has slaves. So he is a king to this kingdom, but he's also a, like a master over these slaves. And that's why you see the word king, you see the word master used in the scripture. So this king decides, all right, I am going to settle my debts with those who are enslaved to me. Because often slavery wasn't like they were caught oppressed and put into slavery. It was they took on a debt from someone else and ended up becoming a slave until that debt is repaid. So this one servant that gets brought to him, which right now we know of one servant, one king, in this this room full of other people that would have been there as he's dealing with these issues. They would have had like legal people like jotting down like, oh, so Steve owed him... 500 denarius and paid in full check steve is good like it, like that's like they would have had other people in the room but the conversation is in between the servant and his master so in this conversation he gets brought in and he says all right how much do you how much does he owe and the person with the scroll goes ten thousand talents now to us that might not mean very much if you spent some a little bit of time in bible school or have dug deeper into the old testament then you might know what a talent is worth. But a talent is a weight of gold. It's a large chunk of gold, and they used the talents to help build the temple way back in the Old Testament times. But that's just random fact for your knowledge brain, as opposed to your not knowledge brain, because, you know, it's all about that. But I decided to go to Google, and, and this is just an estimation. This isn't a perfect number, but to kind of help us understand what 10,000 talents would be worth today. Well, uh, since the talent is a chunk of gold, Google says that 10,000 chunks of the gold, based on the weight of what they can figure what a talent is worth, he would have owed approximately $3.48 billion. Now, that number might have gone up or might have gone down or could be different, but that is a huge amount of money, even as the approximation. Again, the number is not exactly accurate, but $3.4 billion, there most people won't even make that today in their lifetime. I mean, you work a, like a good job, you, you get proper pay raises, all that kind of stuff. You know, you might break a few million over your entire lifetime of income made grossly, but you're not going to break a billion, let alone $3.4 billion. And the reason for this is, is showing how this servant owed beyond what he was able to repay beyond what his family was able to be able to repay, beyond what he would have been worth and his family would have been worth and all of his property and all of his stuff would be worth repaying. I honestly am kind of curious how he got in debt 10,000 talents in a day and age where like a talent was something you had to save for for a very long period of time. It wasn't just like the money came out of nowhere. It took time for it to show up. But here he is. He's in debt, 10,000 talents, a debt he can never repay. So what does the king do? He does what all kings would have done at that point. He says, all right, fine. You are going to be sold. Your wife is going to be sold. Your kids are going to be sold. All of the animals you own, all the valuables you own, the property you own, the tent that you live in, or the house that you live in, depending on you know how rich or poor he was and what he had. He's like, literally everything that has your name on it is now mine. I'm going to sell all of it off to other people. And then I'll take that as payment and we'll say the debt is settled. That, w- that is a normal reaction. Like if, if you had a servant and they, it was impossible for them to repay you, then they owed you their life. And you could just say, all right, I'm going to sell it. Do I think that's right? No. But that's how they handled it back then. So they look at the servant and says, I'm just going to sell everything you have. Now the servant, realizing that, you know, not just, someone's not going to buy his whole family. His wife's going to probably go off somewhere else. His kids are going to be sent off somewhere else. He's going to be somewhere else. 
all the stuff that he has, all the things that he cares about, all the people that he loves, all of them will be gone from him in this moment. And as a last ditch effort, he drops on his knees and he begs. He begs his master to forgive him. Begs his master to give him more time. He's like, please, just give me more time. I'll pay you back. Everyone in the room knows there's no chance he'll ever be able to pay this back. Unless somehow he becomes a king and strikes it super rich. And even then, it would never happen. But he begged the king. He begged his master. And the king, the master sitting there, watching him, seeing him, says, all right, I hear you. I'm going to take pity on you. I'm going to bless you with mercy. I'm going to bless you with grace. And I'm going to wipe your debt completely away. That is absolutely astonishing that he would be willing and wanting to do that. So the servant leaves the king completely free, completely wiped of debt. There is nothing there. There is nothing holding him back. He is a free man. His family's free. His property's free. Everything is free. He gets a complete reset. Now, someone that has debt from school, that sounds really nice. So let's see what he chooses to do with this new life that he has been given because he almost lost everything. So let's keep reading in verse 28 to verses 31 to see what it says. So in 28, it starts off by saying, but when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, I'll repay you. You can see some of the symmetry there. But he refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servant saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. We'll pause it there. So the servant literally just leaving, literally just having this freedom, just working through this, realizing he's a free man, receiving that grace, receiving that mercy, having God work in him, or sorry, having this king, like, just like forgive him and say like, hey, you're free to go. That is a huge blessing, a blessing from this king, but also a blessing from God for this servant. And he walks out and he sees someone else that owes him money. Now this money, now this servant owed him, this fellow servant owed him a hundred denarii. So he wasn't a servant of this servant. They were both servants under the same master. And he owed him a hundred denarii. Now, again, I went back to Google, looked up the value of a denarii, and it's like nothing. So a hundred denarii approximately would be around 37 US dollars. So around like 50, 60 Canadian dollars. That's it. Now, they only made a few denarii a week, usually. Some people made more, but that was about what you needed to live off. It was just a couple. So this was a very feasible payoff. Like in, in reality, if he was able to, you know, bunker down, eat a little bit less, save a little bit of money, not buy, you know, let the clothes hold out a little bit longer, he could have, in a matter of a couple of years, scraped up this 100 denarii to pay back his friend. That, o- that he owed the money to. So totally repayable debt. Completely different than the situation with the servant and the king. There was no way he could pay that $3.4 billion back. But this friend could easily have paid back the 100 denarii. So he, he sees them and he grabs them and he actually chokes him, holding him by the neck, taking breath from him and saying, you owe me money, pay me back. And the, the servant just looks at the other servant, his friend, and says, have patience with me. I will pay you back. Word for word, what that servant had just said to the master. But instead he goes, no. He calls for the guards. He gets them thrown in prison until he can pay it back. And everyone else that had been around, that had seen what just happened to that servant, had seen that he had just been forgiven a debt far greater and a debt that there was no chance he could have repaid, said, something's not right, and we're a little concerned, so we're going to go, and we're going to go tell our master what just happened, what just went down here. So off they go, they go tell the master, and this is the last couple of verses to wrap up this parable for us. So starting in verse 32 all the way to verse 35, it says, 
Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly, fa- my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. That is a heavy thing to talk about. But the word gets to the master. The master hears about it and goes, we need to bring him back. Bring him back right now. So they go and they get him. You know, the king, your master, he wants to talk to you. He shows up and he's like, what's up, man? Like, we're good. I paid off our debt. And he's like, yeah, but how did you just treat your friend? Did you not just throw someone that owed you way less, an easily payable sum, into prison? And the servant looks at the king and goes, yeah, I, I did. I, I want my money. The king's like, well, I wanted my money. And he becomes to get angry, or sorry, he, be- he begins to get angry, and he gets frustrated, and he's like, you know what? You're not forgiven of your debt. Forget it. You actually owe me everything in full, and you're going to jail until you pay me back. Now, what that actually meant was is that this man was going to rot in jail for the rest of his life. Because we know there's no way his family could have, could have got that kind of money together to pay back and to get him out of jail. So he was a completely free man, but he did not extend that grace. He did not extend that mercy to someone else that could have easily have paid him back. We're not even asking him to forgive, just to have that patience and give him more time. He didn't even do that. So that servant died in prison. But there's also something else that's really important to point out here. Because of the way he chose to behave, because he chose not to forgive, because he chose not to give patience, the forgiveness that he received was wiped away. And then in verse 35, and I want to read it for you again, Jesus shares this with his disciples. So he finished the parable in verse 34, and he says in verse 35, So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Now, brother person, however you want to put it, but he's saying if the forgiveness that you've received from God the Father, the, the forgiveness that you know Jesus died on the cross for, if, if, you don't, if you don't forgive the people who have wronged you in your heart, then that forgiveness will be taken away from you like the king took it away from that servant. Now that is a very heavy thing. And as we come to our apps for today, I honestly, like, that's basically it. But I, I, wanted, I wanted to sum it up into two kind of things. One's a challenge, one's kind of just a thought. But our apps for us are forgiveness directly affects our relationship with God. See, God went to great lengths to forgive us, just like that king took on a great financial loss and power loss for him to forgive that servant. When Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that was a huge burden. He took on the weight of all of our sins. He lost his life. He literally gave up a part of the Trinity to die as a human so we could have a chance at redemption with him. That was a huge cost to himself. And he said, I'm willing to pay that for us to be close. But then we also need to live like that has actually changed and impacted us. It would be easy for us to say, I'm no, I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to get my revenge. I'm going to not forgive people. I'm going to hold this anger deep inside my heart. But the problem is, is if your heart becomes heavy with all, all the hate and unforgiveness, it actually impacts the way you live your life. It impacts how you treat other people. It impacts how you show mercy and grace to people. But we are, as Christians, as people who are committed to God, we are called to show grace and mercy. We are called to live a life that is Christ-focused and to, to be witnesses by our actions. And the hard part with that is that means that we need to forgive. Because just as God has given us great freedom in forgiving us of all the sin in our lives, we can then return that gift by forgiving other people and giving them the freedom of the burden of the mistake or the wrong that they have done to us, which also is good for yourself. It's also a selfish thing in a little bit because it sets your heart up to have a place where it's open and able to love 
and care for other people. Now, I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying it's very important because it directly relates to our relationship with God. So as I wrap up the service, I just have one simple question for you. As I wrap up this message, sorry, I have one simple question for you, and that is who in your life do you need to forgive? Who in your life do you need to forgive? I'm sure if we think about it for a little while, there are people that we are going to need to forgive. People, we're going to need to let that go. We're going to need to move past it. And I hope and I pray that in that moment, you'll be able to work through it and be able to forgive them. I'm not saying forget. I'm not saying let things go because, well, humans can do very horrible things to other humans and I'm not belittling that by saying, oh, just let it go. No, but learn to forgive so that way you can heal. So that way maybe they can have healing. And so that way we can become closer to God, the one who loves us so graciously and has given so much for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message of forgiveness. God, I pray that each and every one of us would be willing to give this a shot, to work through the process so we can have freedom, so we can be closer to you, so we can grow in you, but also so we can show your love, your grace, and your mercy to other people and help lead them to your presence so they can be impacted by you forever. Father, we love you and we hope you keep us safe. We hope that you continue to work in us and we hope that you continue to challenge us to trust and lean in you. Pray this in your great and heavenly name. Amen.